Hello and welcome to this special edition of Ask the Expert. To celebrate World Cancer Research Day, this episode is being presented in partnership between the Development and Alumni Relations Office at Queen's and the Patrick G. Johnston Centre for Cancer Research. Don't let cancer become the forgotten sea of COVID-19. We'll explore the impact that the pandemic has had on cancer research and treatment, what this has meant for those accessing services, and what the future holds for research. Right, without further ado, I'd now like to introduce today's panel. Professor Chris Scott is the director of the Patrick G. Johnson Center for Cancer Research, an internationally renowned for his work in the development of antibody and nanomedicine based therapies for the treatment of cancer and other conditions. Chris is actively involved in nanomedicine across the UK and is a trustee of the British Society of Nanomedicine. Professor Mark Lawler is the Associate Pro Vice Chancellor and Professor of Digital Health at Queen's and Chair in Translational Cancer Genomics. With over 30 years experience in cancer research, he was recently awarded the prestigious 2018 European Health Award and his research into cancer inequalities has been heralded and had huge influence at both national and international levels. Mrs. Margaret Grayson, MBE, spent nearly 40 years working in the Belfast Cancer Centre, including many as a therapy radiographer. Since then, she has become an advocate for cancer patients, devoting her time to pioneering patient involvement in cancer research, helping to shape treatment and approaches by medical teams across the UK. Margaret, Margaret represents Northern Ireland on numerous UK-wide research committees and has been the chair of the NI Cancer Research Consumer Forum since 2011. In 2019, she was awarded an MBE for a contribution to cancer research. The final member of today's panel is Professor Joe O'Sullivan. Joe is clinical professor at Queen's, specializing in prostate cancer research and treatment. He established a clinical research program in prostate cancer at Queen's and has led to technological development program in radiation oncology. Joe has played a key role in building the university's international reputation for research in prostate cancer and as one of the directors of, directors of the Fastman Prostate Cancer Center for Excellence is focus on development of novel approaches to treatment using radiation. That's quite a roll call, and I'm sure there are many accolades that I've omitted there. Chris, Mark, Margaret, and Joe, thank you very much for giving your time this evening and participating in the event. Chris, if we could begin with you. I'm sure many people attending today's event and viewing the recording will be aware of the Centre for Cancer Research, but may be unfamiliar with the research carried out. Could I invite you to provide an introduction to the work of the Centre and explain the work that researchers and colleagues are involved with? Certainly. Thank you very much, Andy, and, and welcome everybody this evening to this, this event. This is certainly a, a first for us on World uh, Cancer Research Day to have to do it like that. Um, if, now, if, if you, uh, because I'm at home this evening, if you hear children scream or I suddenly scream because a, our new dog bites me, I think we just have to realise that, like COVID, sometimes things are beyond our control. But anyway, um, so it's my pleasure to, to introduce, make the, the initial introductions tonight. Uh, yes, many of you will know of our cancer centre, but just for people who maybe just aren't aware of how, how it all works, the, the centre was first con uh, conceptualised back in 2004. And uh, the plan was uh, the initial dream uh, and vision of Paddy Johnson was to create a cancer research center that would stand alongside our uh, Belfast uh, Clinical Cancer Center and to provide the, uh, the crucible for uh, scientists and clinicians to come together and to make sure that we, were, we, we, under we understood what the key problems were and that we could address them. And, uh, and our building then was, uh, was put up back in 2007. 
And of course, at the end of last year, we were delighted when the Vice Chancellor uh, announced uh, the change of our name from the Centre of Cancer Research to the Patrick G. Johnson uh, Centre for Cancer to Cancer Research. So key thing of what we do is that our work is what we call clinically informed. That's making sure that we, uh, we, we, we take problems that our clinicians face uh, in, in the cancer center. It's also informed by uh, patient and public involvement to make sure we're, we're asking the key questions that patients uh, uh, think that are important too. And from that, then we come back into the labs and we work out then how do we tackle these problems? What solutions um, uh, what advances can we make that can then be brought back to the clinic and benefit the, the patients? So as I said, we're a mixture of uh, clinicians, of, of basic scientists. And we also have a strong industrial in our center large pharmaceutical environment is absolutely crucial in order to deliver uh, so we've now over four groups students uh, think that we may be having a few technical issues at Chris's end, unfortunately. We'll wait for Chris to rejoin us. I think he may have been having a few problems there. Um, we'll move on um, to the next panel member. Um, and when Chris rejoins us, hopefully he can uh, pick up from where he left off. Mark, can I invite you to talk us through the work that the centre has undertaken um, to assess the impact that COVID-19 has had on cancer patients and services over recent months, please. Sorry, thanks very much, Andy, and hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in this evening. Uh, I want to share with you some of the information and some of the work we've done very recently within the last number of months that's really highlighted uh, the effect of COVID-19 on cancer services and cancer patients. I'm just going to share my screen and just show you a few slides just to, to indicate some of the work we've done and the impact that it's had. So the title of uh, my short presentation, Don't Let Cancer Become the Forgotten Sea in the Fight Against COVID-19. And this is a really important message that I want to get across to everybody here tonight. Um, how did this spark uh, in relation to the work that we did on COVID-19 and cancer? It actually started with a personal story. Unfortunately, my uncle died on the 29th of March from a COVID-related illness. And one of my colleagues, Edward Vidoliak, in the University of Split in Croatia, was sympathizing with me on my loss, but then also wanted to share with me uh, information that he was finding in relation to both patients and citizens in Croatia. And what he said was they were starting to fear a COVID diagnosis more than a cancer diagnosis. That really got me worried. And anecdotally, we'd started to hear the same thing in the United Kingdom. And, but there was no data really to tell us what was happening and no evidence uh, to inform us as to what we should do. And so we started a collaboration between ourselves and Queen's University with DataCan, which is the Health Data Research Hub for Cancer for the United Kingdom and University College London. That work uh, has highlighted uh, really a lot of challenges that we're facing. It featured in many different newspaper articles and also influenced government policy. Uh, what we wanted to do is look to see was there any evidence to back up that claim from my uh, colleague in Croatia? And so what we did was we looked at two measures that are routinely captured by hospital trusts around the United Kingdom. The first is two week waiting or urgent referral time. So this is really an early warning system for the suspicion of cancer. And the second then is patients attending chemotherapy clinics, which is a measure of the therapeutic pathway. And also we would regard it as a proxy measure of the health of the uh, of the cancer service. This slide here, just concentrate on the uh, color uh, here, the green, yellow, and, and pink. And what it's showing us really is that during the COVID pandemic, which is this region, either in relation to urgent referrals or in relation to chemotherapy attendances, you see the significant drop, and it doesn't matter which hospital trust you're looking at, you see the same thing. So we're seeing a, a significant drop both in patients uh, receiving chemotherapy 
but also a significant drop in people with suspicion of cancer being referred on to a cancer specialist. If we look at that in relation to data, we saw 70% drop in relation to uh, urgent referrals and a 40% drop in relation to chemotherapy attendances. We hear a lot about percentages, but what does that actually mean in terms of numbers? What it means is that seven out of 10 people with a suspicion of cancer were not getting referred on to their cancer specialist and four out of 10 uh, cancer patients were not getting access to their chemotherapy at the appropriate time. Uh, this is the first data in the United Kingdom that drew attention to the government, the NHS and the public to the adverse effects of COVID-19 pandemic on cancer. Uh, and one of the things we found, this was weekly data that we collected. So every week we collected data from our hospital trusts. I'm, I'm delighted and proud to say that all of the hospital trusts in Northern Ireland participated. So the five hospital trusts throughout the province all participated in this uh, study. And what I'm showing you here is national data. And what you can see here is there isn't much difference in this uh, plot here. You can see from week to week, there isn't really any difference. But the reason why, although we've looked at this on the 9th of June, what you can see is the data itself is actually only from March. So it's out of date. It's over three months old. If you contrast that with our data, what you can see here, you can see here that it's collected every week. It's showing you right up to date. It's actually, when we looked on the 9th of June, this is just four days earlier. So it's showing you that getting that real-time data really allows us to inform us in terms of what's happening. And then we can look at trying to develop solutions. And um, what you can see here is that disruption in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic was across the cancer pathway in relation to screening, which was essentially stopped, and um, in relation to different diagnostic technologies, which were greatly reduced in terms of MRI or CT scanning. And you can see also there in relation to, uh, uh, to um, uh, treatment. Worryingly also, clinical trials were also reduced significantly and also cancer research capacity, discovery research, translation research. And this is really important because cancer research is the bedrock of how we improve cancer treatment and cancer diagnosis for patients. So if our cancer research is also getting affected as well as our cancer treatment, we really have a problem. Um, and we also found that you know, significant effects in relation to modeling uh, studies that we've done of the potential, and I emphasize the potential for excess mortality and significant risks of uh, excess cancer deaths um, in patients with cancer. One of the things that this has taught us is that people, if they have suspicion of cancer, they really should go to their GP and also should, if they have suspicion of cancer, they should look to be referred on to a specialist. So it's very important that we get that message across. Worryingly, in relation to three months of disruption, we've modeled and it looks that we're actually shifting cancer so that it's going to be detected later. If we detect it later, then it means it's more difficult to treat. And so that could be pro problematic. Showing you here for three different cancers, lung, breast, and colorectal. And really what we're seeing is the potential of reducing five-year survival due to the effects of the pandemic and its disruption on the health service. Uh, this data we presented to the European Cancer Organization, which is Europe's largest multidisciplinary uh, cancer organization. And they were really interested in this data. It's probably the earliest data that came out in relation to the effects of COVID. And we're now leading a special network or co-leading a special network on COVID-19 and cancer. And we will report on that at the European Cancer Organization Summit in November. Uh, we also provided evidence into uh, WHO Europe uh, the 70th session, we presented uh, data into that. I'm very happy for these slides, by the way, to be shared with everybody so that you can look at in more detail and also use the links to go into some of the videos and some of the reports in relation to that. So what has been the impact? I think the impact has been profound because it's actually made people sit, sit up and take notice of the fact that you know something is happening because of COVID-19 to cancer services and, and potentially risking uh, cancer patients and also cancer diagnosis. Uh, we shared our data with all four chief medical officers and the National Cancer Director, um, and this contributed to the decision to start restoring cancer services. Uh, we saw very significant interest in the research community, a lot of coverage, um, including immediate questions of the Prime Minister on his first briefing, uh, press briefing after his return from COVID-19 hospitalization and also the phase three letter from Simon Stevens, who's the CEO of the NHS saying that cancer is the first priority for recovery. 
So again, important influencer in relation to the data that was generated here in Northern Ireland and to that. What are the implications? The implications are that we really need to do something about this. So it needs to be addressed urgently. And now the data that we are generating is helping us to actually address the scenario on how we use the data to help us in terms of reducing the risk of excess death due to cancer and looking at ways in which we can actually get the system to stop them running and uh, not only at 100%, but probably we need to get at 130%. It's also taught us that the new normal, as we now see, can't be the same as the old normal. And some of the things that have come out of COVID-19, for example, video consultation with patients, as I'm sure Joe will refer to, have actually been good things. And hopefully we change for the better in relation to what we do. Uh, one of the things that the government has said a lot in terms of follow the science, I would suggest a caveat to that follow the data is really important, and particularly that real-time data. And we're now setting up a, a UK-wide national network and that will actually collect real-time data across the board for cancer uh, patients and to improve cancer care. Um, so really my message uh, is in relation to unlocking the power of data is the way in which we can improve cancer care. And very much the emphasis that cancer research is a really important part of the story. And we need to make sure that cancer research gets back to its pre-COVID-19 levels because it's really important to realize that patients who are treated in research active hospitals or research active centers have much better outcomes. So cancer research really makes sense. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Super, thank you very much, Mark. Um, there's a couple of points I picked up there um, that I'm gonna put a hold on asking for now because I would actually like to move directly on to, on to Margaret. And Chris, I see that you've been able to rejoin us I want to come back to you after Margaret um, to continue your section, if that's okay. Margaret, um, following on from uh, Mark's sort of stark presentation there, um, as an advocate for cancer patients, could you explain the impact that the pandemic has had um, in real life terms of those trying to access services? Okay, and thank you for the invitation to share tonight uh, with everyone else. I suppose, Andy, the, I should really, to answer your question, I think we'll look at different groups of people within the patient, um, within the patient world. Mark has spoken and been able to show us some of that data. Um, and it really, I think, helps us within the public arena uh, to see how important data is and how it's used, how it's collected, how it's used, and the power that it actually has to influence services, influence decision and policy making. Now, I ask people, just going back to the first few months of, of COVID, I ask people about a word um, that would come to mind about that era. And it was a little four letter word that they brought to mind and it was the word fear. Now, we've had a great um, health message over these past number of years to tell people if you feel that there's something different happening in your body or if you have different symptoms, please don't hesitate. Please go to your GP and if you need to be referred, you will be referred for further, further tests. And for many of the things that you would go to, it wouldn't mean that you had a cancer diagnosis. And that message has not changed. That message is still there. But then there was another very strong message came out. Um, and I'm sure every one of us here on the call or listening remember those early days when we were bombarded 24 seven with this message. We were asked to stay at home. We were asked to protect our NHS. Uh, and that message was very strong. And people listened to that message People also told me that they thought the GPs weren't working anymore, that they were closed for business. They hadn't realized that the way they were doing business was very different. And not only were they thinking about protecting the NHS by not going, they also had a great fear that if they were referred on for other tests, that they might even get the virus if they went into the hospital. 
So that was the great world of fear and the message it came across. And in actual fact, it became a case that um, people who were in that situation told me that the fear of COVID was greater than the fear um, of cancer and what that meant to us. Now, uh, Mark has shown us the percentages and the numbers, but every one of those numbers is a person. Every one of those numbers is an individual, a life, a person who has got friends and family. And it's just so important that people go when they have symptoms. When you're diagnosed and the stage you're diagnosed at is important. It impacts the treatment plan. It impacts even for some people on survival. So that's a very strong message that still needs to get across today. Another group of people um, who I've talked to, I've had some friends who did not get their screening appointments. There are many hundreds of appointments go out every week in our whole population screening service. And it's so important, it's drilled into people, keep those. But those appointments haven't been happening. Screening was stopped. And so it's important as we move forward that that backlog, um, that sort of big hump in some way is resourced so that those people can have their screening. Very few of them might be diagnosed with cancer, but the whole point of screening is that it's di cancer is diagnosed early and therefore it helps in treatment and in survival. That's important. Another group of people that I've spoken to um, are really our patients who were already diagnosed, newly diagnosed patients, just when, when COVID came um, on the scene. Um, one man shared with me that his, he had been diagnosed just the week before lockdown. And when uh, he, he was diagnosed, he was told the main plan for his treatment was surgery, how important that was for him, his life-saving surgery. His surgery um, couldn't happen, but he wasn't abandoned by, by the team. Um, his, his treatment plan was readjusted. He had a diff treatment in a different form. People who had perhaps their chemo put on hold, people who had their radiotherapy treatment plan changed. You know, when any one of us um, start our treatment as a patient, we, we are always told, um, now you need to follow this treatment through from beginning to end. Uh, and that's so important to us as patients that we follow that treatment through. But here for some people, that, that treatment was put on hold. That treatment that they'd been told was important for them and for their life-saving uh, treatment. So there were many hard decisions made. I, I can only imagine people like Joe and the oncology team that making decisions that wed up between the risk factors of cancer and the risk factors of treatment and the risk factors of COVID. You know, uh, when any one of us um, are diagnosed with cancer, uh, you, you literally walk into a room, a person, and when you um, speak, the consultant says three words to you, you have cancer. You walk out the room as a patient with a patient label. And with that label, there becomes a great sense of vulnerability um, a lack of control over your life. Add to that the anxiety of dealing with COVID as well. And it, perhaps it gives an understanding uh, to the rest of you of what some of those patients were dealing with. There's another large group of patients that probably I belong to um, who live with and beyond cancer. Uh, and many concerns for them were for people who were on three monthly routine CT scans were they going to happen? Or were they not going to happen? The anxiety around that. And if they were sent an appointment for it to, to happen, were they actually going to go and go into the hospital for fear of all that might be there? Um, I was very fortunate. I had my review appointment uh, by telephone. Not quite the same as seeing the person face to face, but I had my review appointment. So that was good. And there have been many innovative ways of communicating and dealing with patients. And that is so important. But the last group of patients really talk about are those who, who were um, on clinical trials and, and the fact that the, the clinical trials for most of them were put on hold at that point in time. Um, 
I, ha I have a friend who, who doesn't live in Northern Ireland, but he lives in England, who, a, a young woman who was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, and she had the hope of getting on a certain clinical trial, but that clinical trial was put on hold. Um, she couldn't have that. And that was her glimmer of hope that she was holding on to. Um, this is uh, World Cancer Research Day. That's why we're having the conversation, I presume. Um, we talk about excellence in cancer care and services. And if you ask anyone in Northern Ireland, from the highest in the government to any one of us in the population, we would want excellence in cancer care and services. But you can't have that unless you have excellence in research as well because research decides what the outcomes eventually will be for those of us in treatment. There is no one who, who is um, diagnosed and then has a treatment plan without that treatment plan being rooted in research. The type of research that's done in the Patrick Johnson Center uh, that then comes across to clinical trials when it comes to work with Joe. That research, it's so important. You know, for every one of us, you know, that research decided my treatment. It decided how my technique from an mastectomy, it decided the chemotherapy drugs that I would have. It decided the dose and fractionation of radiotherapy. It decided the drug I took this morning. Research is the basis for us moving forward. And that's why it has taken such a hit, not just cancer services, but research as well, that needs really to be found a way for the government to, 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 to plug that gap. So many um, cancer charities, big cancer charities that don't have the money that in turn will impact on reducing research funding. So all of that put together um, needs to be brought forward and looked at. Cl clinical trials in Northern Ireland are now starting up again. The patients who were put on hold were very well looked after by the Cancer Trials Network and communicated with in different ways, again, innovative ways. Those who were on trial oral drugs, I told that they had those delivered um, to their homes. So we've learned many things um, as patients and as professionals, I would imagine, through COVID. But one of the biggest things I find in listening to people and talking with people is that there's been a working together and working together, not just in the fourth and four nations at that level, but in, in their diff different disciplines and working together. And I would imagine that's the way forward as we pick services and research up again. And all I would say is when we're picking those all up again and discussing and making decisions and policies, but also to have that patient voice that's central into it. Can I say thank you to researchers? Thank you to people like Joe and the team, um, because they actually do care about us as patients, um, more than just it's their job. Um, but thank you, and we look, we look to you to move things forward for us. Thank you. Margaret, thank you very much. You spoke heavily there about cancer research and, uh, and the importance of it going now and going forward. Uh, and on that cue, I'd like to bring Chris Scott back into the room um, to, to continue um, his introduction which I think is going to be relevant um, for the remainder of the session in terms of putting the content into context. Chris, welcome back. Thank you, Andy. Uh, apologies. I think we had a, a heavy shower here and it knocked out my internet. But uh, yes, so uh, very, very, always very hard to follow after Margaret. She speaks so passionately about research and it demonstrates the importance of the patient's voice in everything that we do. And, um, you know, it, it reminds me too that it really is the, the, the job that we have at Queen's uh, working with uh, people, training people, doing research. It is a privilege. It's not a right. It's not. It's 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 it is an absolute privilege to do to do this research. And uh, and of course, COVID has had the impact. And we know that we were closed down in, in March. And there was a lot of work done behind the scenes to try and organize um, how, how we could reopen. Um, I, I want people, though, it's important people to realize that um, whilst we were officially closed, there was work ongoing and the people from the center were contributing to the COVID effort. So straight away, our medical trainees were all drafted into the Nightingale uh, Hospital. 
then uh, researchers, uh, scientific researchers within the center were involved in uh, helping, which was a nationwide uh, testing. Um, there, was, there was shortages in equipment, there was shortages in, in reagents, uh, plasticware. And so everybody in the country was pulling together to try and, and, and uh, in, in improve our capacity because there's no doubt about it, we, we were as a nation caught napping. We were also then involved in, in, in doing zero prevalence work for the uh, chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. Uh, and that work was, was undertaken. And, um, and I think the key thing that we found during lockdown was, and again, alluded, uh, Margaret alluded to this, was that we found new ways of working. We developed new relationships. We found ways of getting over some barriers that there would be to getting research done quickly uh, between the trusts, within the university, and, uh, and I, I guess just, just red tape. And that has led to what I hope will be new relationships and a faster way of translating our research going forward. So, you know, COVID has been really hard, but hopefully that's a, that's a small benefit that might come out of it all. So, um, so we reopened again in June, and, uh, and 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 we're working within obviously government guidelines of how we can get our, our research moving again, and it has done so, and we're so thankful for that. However, as you know, our research is heavily dependent on charities, and uh, we we, uh, we 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 did lose money from from Cancer Research UK, who uh, are, um, are 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 struggling, I guess, at the moment, like like we we all are. And I'm delighted to say and to acknowledge the um, the the leg the lecky legacy that through the foundation was able to step in and support seven researchers uh, to the tune of about £65,000 in order to, um, to retain those, those research budgets that, that are needed. So, um, so that has been a fantastic uh, opportunity and, and benefit to us. So I'd, I'd like to thank the, the Leckie from, from that. So the, uh, Alexander Leckie was originally from Belfast, studied at Queen's, um, and he left in his will uh, a legacy um, w w that, uh, that we were able to tap into uh, for, for this important work. So we're, 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 we're working away again, and um, the, it has been an interesting journey. It has been uh, pulling together um, teamwork in particular, working across shifts, um, I'm, you know, we, we, we see how things are changing daily again and, and, uh, and we have to adapt to that. But there, we're there to do research, we're there to train scientists and uh, I'm delighted to say that that has been um, moving along very, very well. And it's thanks to our benefactors, charities, that we're able to do that. And, and I can't thank people enough. So with that, um, Andy, I'll, I'll hand over to Joe to talk about the real work. Okay. Sorry, Andy, I can't hear you there. On mute. Joe, we've obviously heard from the panel about the effects of recent months um, has had. Now, as a cancer specialist, yeah. could you explain what this means for research and treatment going forward and what it might mean for future funding models? Sure, Andy. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the invite to speak. It's great to join us like this and, and get a chance to talk about the issues. Um, if you think about can't think of it in three headings, mind of the Clint Eastwood movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, being an optimist as I am, I'm going to keep the good to last and talk about the ugly and bad first. So the ugly is the, if we think back to February and March, the ugly scenes we saw in Wuhan and China, in, in, in Italy, we saw hospitals overrun with patients. We saw it's really suffering from this new disease, new, almost nothing about at the time, because it seemed like, and it's been proven to be the case, that older patients are vulnerable to the effects of having a more severe infection 
more severe outcomes and more likely to, to die from the, from the disease. And it also seen colleagues in Italy, especially that cancer patients, especially those undergoing treatment, which might, might be particularly vulnerable to the effects of this disease. So it was very ugly scenes that we saw. This led to very, very ugly conversations that we had to start having, start having about, about mid-March onwards. And those conversations went along the lines of what Margaret was describing and also what Mark was describing in his data. And because we were having conversations with patients saying, look, we're gonna have to stop your chemotherapy now. We think that the risk benefit, you know, two months ago, chemotherapy was, a good, was worth the risk for you for whatever benefit it was gonna give. Now, because of this virus or the threat or danger from this virus, we think the bad uh, Joe, you're, you're breaking up. So we had a very difficult, and for us, we are so passionate about the treatment. Okay. Um, you're just yeah, coming in, out, in and out that. a wee bit, and I'd hate for too much um, of that content to be lost. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if you switch off the other videos, Andy. Sometimes that helps. You know, is it worth trying? How's how's that? Carry on, Joe, and see how that. I'll give I'll give it a try. Maybe keep you keep you on, Andy, so I can see and you hear me. Okay. Yes, that's that's better. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes when there's too many videos on, it can it can crash. So we were having very difficult and I suppose ugly conversations with patients, telling them we could stop chemo, and and a cancer researcher as well, telling many patients that. And Margaret was describing some patients ready to start a clinical trial, and we had to tell them that we couldn't start the trial because many clinical trials, in fact, were suspended to recruitment. Uh, so that, that was the ugly part. The bad part, well, there are many bad parts. And again, Mark's data and Margaret's conversations with, with, the, with, with the patients she was describing fit with the bad. The bad, first of all, if we see, going to see a negative outcome for cancer in this Joe, I think, this pandemic. To, I think a, they need to reconnect. Um, okay, I'd hate okay, for the I'll attendees out, okay. to lose this. To, okay, to miss I'll, out I'll, drop out. I'll drop out. I'll drop out now. Come straight back in. At this point, I'll start fielding some of the questions that we have received. Um, Mark, this first one is for you actually. So if I can invite you to rejoin, which you have done, thank you. Um, so this question comes from Andrew. And he says, current COVID-19 situation results may result in reduced five-year positive outcomes. Does this become more important with cancer diagnosis in delayed, e.g. diagnosis at uh, T4 stage? If so, what do you suggest can be done to help cancer patients and their carers? Thank you very much, Andrew, for the question. A very good question. Um, so one of the things we've very much emphasised in relation to this is the need um, to get services back as quickly as possible. And, and Joe will probably talk about this in a few minutes. And the response has been tremendous in relation to that. I suppose the work that I presented showed what the problem was and highlighted that problem and said, you know, we really need to get those services back on as quickly as possible. And, and what we're now seeing is that response um, of the health service across the United Kingdom um, to do that. Um, as I said, the one thing that's important is, and Margaret obviously highlighted as well, is the need to deal with that bulge where we obviously had to stop certain things. So when we restart, we want to obviously make sure to get up to better than pre-COVID-19 levels. Um, so one of the things we, we emphasize is that you know, just getting back to what we were before is probably not you know, sufficient. We need to do more than that, probably get to 130%. But, but that's the way in which we address that issue, Andrew, um, by actually making sure our services are, are, are back to normal and even better than normal um, to address some of those issues so that we don't see that stage shift to a more severe disease, which is obviously more difficult to treat. I see Joe is back now, so I'll... I'll go off and, and let Joe come in. Okay. Hi, Joe. Um, 
Can you hear me okay, Andy? Can you, is it? Yes, you are. You are better. Through, you're is that better? Through better now. Okay? Yeah. Okay. I'll try. Let, let's try again. So I was just talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I was in the middle of the bad. Uh, don't worry, I'm getting to some good as well. Uh, um, the bad. So I think alluding to what Mark was just saying and showing that the you know that the for sure we're seeing less patients coming forward for a diagnosis of cancer. We, we've seen a drop, significant drop in diagnosis. For example, I was at clinic this morning. Normally we would have 12 new prostate cancer patients attending. We had one, one new patient. That's the lowest number of new patients we've ever had. So there's there's a there's a big problem. Uh, there's there's no doubt whatsoever that that is going to translate into worse outcomes and it's going to need a massive national effort, much bigger than the effort dealing with COVID, uh, as Mark was alluding to. And um, the other bad aspects then is, the, as I said, the, the clinical trials, uh, you know, funding is the other big issue. And Chris alluded to this as well. Mostly like this, like the UK, is so dependent on charitable funding for cancer research. It is completely insane. We totally depend on Cancer Research UK, Prostate Cancer UK, so many charities to fund research. Uh, and the funding of those charities comes from people organizing events, running marathons, doing all these things which have basically stopped completely. Okay, our local charities, are Friends of the Cancer Center, many of these charities are letting go their staff, there's no longer. So there's gonna to have to be a massive government input into rich country, government funds cancer research and in the uk yes there's government funding but not nearly enough so i talked about the good the bad and the ugly we've heard ugly we've heard bad there are some good aspects i think when you think of this being world cancer research day one of the good aspects of this covid 19 pandemic is that it's made us realize the importance of research generally of clinical research in particular but also scientific research generally you know, the idea of the search for a vaccine, for antibody tests, for better ways of screening. It's very clear <clears throat> that even, even Idiot and Gove and Hancock, sorry if anybody loves those people, but they are idiots. Even they talk about clinical trials now. So and at least it's got clinical trials and clinical research and research generally into the public discourse. And I think when you hear people talking about, you know, the rush for a vaccine, we see that the steps involved are, are, are laborious and it takes a while to get there. So at least it's, it's raised that awareness. There have been some other good aspects. I think Margaret mentioned some of the patients she knows have benefited from that. We're certainly doing a lot more virtual clinics. It, it helps the other major crisis in the world, called the climate crisis. And I think we've, we've learned how to to work like this remotely. It's not as, you know, some face, face to face is obviously very important. And the other good thing is that the NHS has really rallied together. You know, the, the, the camaraderie, the collegiality, and the ability to face up to this huge crisis and to work together. And we have essentially got our cancer services back up to speed again. The problem now is people are afraid to come forward to be diagnosed. So I think there are some good aspects, including, you know, and delivery of oral medications, et cetera. There, are some, there have been good, some good aspects to it, but I think the good, the bad, and the ugly summarizes the situation. So sorry if my, my connection wasn't so good. No, I, I think we um, I think we got um, the sort of crux of the content there, Joe. One thing actually that I picked up throughout um, all the all the panel's uh, speeches was obviously there is stark warnings going forward, but um, there seems to have been a sense of collaboration developing. Um, Mark mentioned, for example, the collaboration between the NA, uh, Northern Ireland Trusts. Do you think that bodes well going forward? Do you think that's something that will be able to be maintained and carried on into the future, a sense of collaboration? I, I really hope so. Um, especially, especially working in the NHS, I think that it's important to see that this organization, the NHS, is very severely under threat by this current government. And you know, the commoditization of, 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 of healthcare, and we see that the importance of a heavily properly funded healthcare system, which both you know 
can deal with a pandemic of, of this, of this COVID-19, but can also deal with cancer. You know, that health has to be a priority. If the health of the nation is not a priority for government, then I don't know what is. And if you look at the Tory government policy for the last 10 years, it's been to, it's really to, to, to knock back the health service and try and privatize it. And this is a real wake up call to have that. Sorry to be political. I think, Andy, just to also emphasize, you know, I was proud that Northern Ireland really stepped up to the plate in relation to providing data uh, for the work that we did. Um, and and you know, that was really great. And it's also allowed us to look at comparisons. And, and certainly we were doing as well as the other parts of the United Kingdom. One of the questions that came in in relation to the chat was, was very much in that. But I, I think that spirit of collaboration is really important. And certainly I've seen it across not just the United Kingdom, but as I said, we're now working with European colleagues and there's a really, you know, we're in this together to fight the virus. We should be competing against the virus and against cancer, not against each other. Um, and that's really uh, has been borne out over the last number of months in terms of that collaborative and people sharing data with each other, because we want to get to the bottom of the situation and also come up with solutions. And that's what we're in that sort of solution phase now. And that's where we need to share information, see what we did, see what other countries did, and use that to get to a, a new normal, a better normal. And um, mm -hmm. so that is one of the things I think because people just realized you, you can't sit in your ivory tower, sit in your silo and just work on your own data. You have to really share that. So that's been one of the good aspects. And certainly it's been a particularly uh, privileged at the European level to work with uh, you know, excellent, amazing colleagues. And, and we both respect each other in terms of bringing you know, similar problems, challenges, but also potential solutions uh, to the problem going forward. You mentioned that. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry, Margaret. Um, I'm just going to follow up on that. Um, just, I, I know the amount of work and all the recovery and, and it's just really impressive. Um, I think also that that really needs to be communicated very clearly um, to the rest of the population so that people start to lose that fear um, of going to a GP or of going into a center and thinking and see if they, they have to, um, the communication has to be, we are caring about you. We hear, of, we know about COVID, we're, we are doing things to keep you safe. Um, and we are returning our services, not just to how they were, but we're hoping in this, all the new innovation to even move forward. So I think communication to people um, in general, it just backs up what, what the rest have said. Yeah, there should be a national campaign for that. I mean, that's the one thing I think there should be a national campaign that's actually saying it is safe to go to your doctor. You need to go to your doctor if you have symptoms of cancer or suspicions of cancer uh, that you want to get checked. We have to get that message across and that's a, a public health message. So, you know, like the public health message that was earlier, and that Margaret alluded to, we now need a public health message in relation to cancer. And that's really important for people to access services. And, and, and you know, if they have worries to actually go to their GP, be referred on to the specialist um, and similarly in relation to cancer treatment. And, and you know, they're the messages really that we think need to be got across um, to our citizens, um, both here in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. Um, Mark, you alluded to one of the questions that's uh, recently come in. It asks how the local situation in Northern Ireland compares to the rest of the UK. Has there been has there been a different approach taken in Northern Ireland as a region compared to the rest of the country? I'll let Joe come in on this as well because he'll probably have some local knowledge too. I, I mean, I, I think one of the things is that you know certainly the, the, the all four chief medical officers across the United Kingdom were receptive to the data that we shared with them uh, because we felt we had to share it. And so this is before we tried to publish it or anything like that. We felt it was so important that we actually had to share it with them. And you know, thankfully that response, and I've shown you in relation to some of the responses of, for example, the, the CEO of the NHS, um, I, I think what's been important has been to keep those messages very clear and very straightforward um, and look to ways in which we can actually use that to help to you know, get rebalance our service 
And so the, as Joe said, it now becomes a cancer service rather than a COVID service. Um, which obviously for, for different reasons and not intentionally, but you know, that was what was happening about March, April when we were at the um, nadir in relation to the pandemic. Joe, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I think, I think overall, in fact, if you think locally with regards to COVID, we've done a lot better than the rest of the UK. And I think that's testament to really local action is what makes a difference. So if you've got a government and, a, and, a, and the local assembly that we can trust and, and, uh, and I think local action, especially being able to be agile enough to have local measures, makes a big difference. Similarly, I think the solution will be local as well. You know, we can't depend on a national government that is so diverse, so who has such a complex country to run. I think solutions around the UK are going to have to be local. So we have the advantage of being just geographically separate from the rest of the UK, and therefore we've got a smaller population to deal with. I think sending back to speed are benefiting from that smaller size. And when it comes to cancer research funding similarly, I think we're going to have to look locally to help ourselves. We're going to have to look at organizations like Queen's Foundation, like local charities, and our local and really lobbying our local government, very good access to local government here or to a local assembly, much more so than we would have to Westminster, for example. So I think that we have done better generally with COVID and we can Yes. Had a, so, uh, I, oh, sorry, Chris. Yes, so I would agree with what Joe has said there. Yes, I, I, our small size, our agility, and how we have responded to the issues has been really important. And the close connectivity that the academics and the clinicians have to, uh, to not only the trust managements, but then also the central NHS and the, and the, and the public health agency. And, that, and that's been, been key. And, uh, and just to come back on the whole idea, you know, the new relationships we have, you know, you can now lift the phone to people that you didn't know before in different organizations. And that's, that's a roadmap for us for the future. So I, I'm excited about that. But we do need uh, better emphasis here as a region on, on our fundraising activities and what we can do for, for ourselves because we can't depend on, uh, on other areas. And, uh, and that's clear moving forward. We've spoken quite heavily about collaboration. Um, obviously, the Cancer Research Centre is part of Queen's, but to what extent have, um, have you been able to work with um, other faculties and schools, um, for example, engineering, perhaps, um, on, on any of the work around COVID and, and cancer research. Are you able to talk on that at all? Yes, uh, certainly at a very practical level. Uh, I, can, I can tell you at, at, at some stages that what we had to do as a university was that our technicians all came together and helped create a lot of the reagents that were missing for the, the Northern Ireland testing uh, uh, facilities. And, uh, and that involved uh, bringing together <coughs> certainly engineering uh, faculty and our own medicine and health, health life, life sciences. So there has been uh, that area of, of, of collaboration as well. And also in PPP, you know, and in protection PPE as well, there's been a lot of work between both pharmacy, but also uh, engineering as well. So I'm actually producing for the NHS, for the, the health services, uh, personal protection equipment. So, so that's been one area which has been really effective. The other area has been in the use of data. Uh, where we've looked at ways in which we can share expertise um, going forward and, and using you know, AI and machine learning, for example, in that setting. And, and that's been very much working forward and, and, and particularly going to be important going forward for Northern Ireland in the context of the Belfast region city deal, uh, where we're going to focus a lot on using data to drive innovation, um, both in the health sector and the agri-food sector as well. So um, I think you know that it's boded very well in terms of how we work together, and I think you know, what both Joe and Sa and Chris have said that ability to be nimble uh, and, and actually respond quickly to things in Northern Ireland is something that actually I think will stand us in very good stead going forward. 
Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that there's been a few questions coming here that I'd, I'd like to cover. Um, so uh, one question from uh, Roisin. Um, the NHS was focusing on getting the number of people having cancer back to near normal levels. This is reassuring, but understandably, with the numbers increasing once again in COVID-19, is cancer treatment likely to be stalled again? Should that be a valid concern for people? I think we've uh, I think the first wave. Go, go on, Joe. It's an I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mark. No, I just think I think it's an understandable concern. However, we know a lot more about uh, um, the, the the behavior of the virus and its interaction with cancer. And also, you know, the hospital environment. And if anybody who's been to visit the hospital recently will see, we've really got great uh, social distancing set up. You know, we're trying to limit the number of people. The hospital is a much safer environment. We know more about cancer. We're much more confident giving chemotherapy. And I think we're also much more determined to keep the cancer services running. I think the cancer research may be a different story because of funding and if we do get us well when we get the second wave not when not if and that we will cope with that because i think we have the make the, the systems in place so i'm much more confident stage i think as well just to add to that uh, we, we've also some of the research we've done uh, work that etna mcfern who's a um research fellow is funded by cancer focus northern ireland uh, with ourselves and with um, researchers in um, the Marsden, uh, Claire Turnbull particularly has shown ways in which we now are able to select out particular patient groups where we, we can do different things. So it's not a sort of a one size fits all approach. Uh, we've been very interested in looking at triaging different patients, uh, particularly in colorectal or bowel cancer. So I think you know some of the research we've done as well has taught us how to respond much better and that not necessarily a one size fits all in relation to how we respond to a second wave, for example. And um, so I, I think that's been invaluable and it's really given us ways in which we can select out who are the patients who we really need to shield and who are the patients then who actually can go on to receive treatments. And similarly, uh, you know, that same message we want to get across that people still need to access um, their GP if they have suspicion of cancer even in a scenario where uh, COVID is, is, is potentially rising. And as Joe emphasized, you know, it's really important that you know, we have now got you know, very good social distancing, very good approaches in relation to cleaning, PPAE as well. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, you know, we've learned a lot, unfortunately, you know, in very difficult circumstances. But I think that learning and the research we've done uh, will really allow us to be much more proactive in our approach going forward um, if there is a second wave. I think also um, that's the information. People will be frightened to an extent again because we hear the numbers are rising. But then the information that you're talking about and the plans that you have in place, what has been set in place, what you have learned from working together because of COVID, again, that's the communication thing, isn't it? Um, I think patients just need to have that trust. Um, not that they don't trust their oncology team or anything, but perhaps because of what's happened over the past few months, um, there's a bit of a wobble in that trust and that confidence. And I think that is so important that it's just communicated and built up again um, to have that understanding of being okay to go for treatment or for referral or whatever it is. Back, back I suppose, is like the same message, um, but then finding a way to... Um, heighten people's trust and people's confidence to step forward. That actually, Margaret, that actually leads on to um, another question that's come in from Andrew, um, who says uh, he agrees about seeking GB, uh, GP guidance about symptoms, which obviously we spoke about earlier, but how does the everyday person um, know which of these may be important and whether to ask a GP for guidance, especially now when GP surgeries have restricted access. Is there a case therefore for education and including family members and carers? And if so, how in your view should this be, um, should, should this be delivered? Well, I mean, I think 
it, 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 it's, it's a bit worrying if the cancer aware program, uh, for, uh, information program from the local government obviously hasn't hit, hit Andrew. Um, there, there's a very, very nice um, um, basically information service from the, from the local government called Cancer Aware that tells you the kind of symptoms to look out for, for cancers. So for example, a persistent cough or coughing blood or these sort of type of things. I'd also recommend the Cancer Research UK website, very, very clear list of symptoms that of cancer. So I'd strongly recommend that. And I totally agree. It's not just people with the symptoms need to be aware. Family members need to be aware as well. But I can tell you the GPs still have a red flag referral system. One of the symptoms that would be worrying like a lump that hasn't been there before or, or a, a hoarseness that hasn't gone away that is common hasn't gone away the gps can still refer red flag referrals which means that you have to be seen or at least um, spoken to in 10 days so the, the same program exists it, it is definitely under under a bit of strain but it absolutely is still there and i with, with regard to the information about cancer i would recommend the Cancer Research UK website for a start off, um, but also the, the local Department of Health, Cancer Aware, very nice guidance on the kind of symptoms to look out for. Yeah, that's just <laughs> been put in the chat, actually. It's just been put in the chat there for everybody. Ethna's just put it in the chat, so just if people need to access that. Yeah, I think there is information out there um, as about the cancer with Cancer Aware, Be Cancer Aware, and with Cancer Research UK site. Uh, but also, most of us know um, our own bodies to the extent. Um, and so if there's some, something that suddenly is different or concerns you, uh, then it's okay to go to your GP and ask. Many of the things that you might go with will not necessarily mean that you will have a cancer diagnosis. But the whole point is, please go. Um, please lift that phone. The process is there, it's very clearly marked out, um, but don't hesitate. Uh, don't hesitate to ask your GP. Don't hesitate to speak to them. Um, they will know and be aware when it's appropriate for you to be uh, referred on. Uh, but the information is there. Please don't ever Google things. Because as patients, if we Google things, wow, the most amazing things come into our head that are so incorrect. Um, and the hard thing is, once it's in your head, it's very hard to get it out of your head. And that's very true. You know, if I'd Google breast cancer or if you Google prostate cancer, the, what you get hundreds and thousands, probably millions of hits. But the information that they give you, Andrew, is not necessarily good information, but it eats away in your head once you get it in. So please look at the sites that are there that give you clear information um, and just not to be frightened of going and asking for your GP's opinion. We're coming into the last 15 minutes or so now. Uh, we've had another question come in. Um, if the government is not going to promote accessing cancer services, is there something that Queen's could do to communicate this in Northern Ireland? Good question. Um, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier, and I think it also goes back to sort of partnership approaches. You know, I do think we need to be you know, getting the messaging out more. Uh, one thing that's been shown is that in the UK, and this was an international cancer benchmarking partnership, we're actually not as good at approaching our GP. We tend to have, the, this was a survey that was done that showed that more UK people say, oh, I, I don't want to go to my GP because I don't want to trouble them. Uh, where it's interesting compared with other jurisdictions where people do go to their GP. So I do think there is something in, in actually having a campaign of messaging. We, we saw how effective, you know, in terms of some of the messaging in relation to COVID was in the early stages. So I definitely think there's something there in terms of thinking about how we message in relation to cancer. Um, because as Joe said, we're, we're still seeing the scenario where we're not seeing the same number of cancer diagnoses as we would expect to see in, at this time. And um, so, so obviously something in the system is not happening properly. So I do think we need to think about, um, yes, obviously using you know, what Joe said and the Be Cancer Aware CRUK, but we're obviously still missing cases. Um, and so there is a case for us looking at how we can communicate and using 
you know, sort of media, using social media, etc. Yeah. So uh, uh, to re- reiterate that, um, I believe that the university has a, a key role to play. And I, I think, and I, I guess we can see this with COVID as well, is um, when you hear the same message over and over again, and sometimes people get that, but, but sometimes having different stories, different media coming from different angles, it resonates with some people more than others. Or it, it takes something else to click with certain individuals. So whilst we have things like the, uh, the Be Aware, Be Cancer Aware and I, um, the, the, the stories that we put out in the local press and, 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 uh, and the national press showing the work that we're doing, I, I, I think all, all those different types of approaches can make sure that we, 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 we click with, 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 with a greater uh, percentage or proportion of the population. And just to let you know, uh, I, I, the BBC I would, Spotlight program in relation to this whole area. I say that, you know, sorry, Joe, go on. Yeah. No, I, just, I was just going to say that, you know, all of you have joined uh, this, this meeting tonight. So you're all obviously interested in cancer research and cancer care. And each one of you, I assume, is a very in Northern Ireland. You employ the politicians. It's important, and not just the university. Emphasis doom and gloom about it. We are heading for a big problem in cancer research funding. We could be holding this meeting at the Austrian Museum next year, not because of it's a nice venue, but because it'll be a, a specimen like the dinosaur or the mummy. I'm serious. You know, cancer research is almost is, is under an existential threat now because of the lack of because of the dependence on the charitable sector and cancer research. It's not a luxury. We don't make any progress without it. As, as, as Margaret mentioned, cancer research is a mark of quality in the way we deliver services. So it's important for each and every one of you as well, when you get an opportunity to talk to your local politicians to emphasize this, we are heading for a major, major problem here. Sorry to be the one with the doom. Well, there's, just, there's a call to action for everybody there, I think. Margaret, um, I, have a, I have a question of my own here um, that I'd been hoping to get in before the end of the session. During your segment at the beginning, you spoke obviously extensively about um, the myriad of sort of uh, effects that it's had on people accessing services. And what struck me when you were talking about that is the mental health aspect now, do you think there now needs to be more um, focus on holistic care in relation to mental health for cancer patients? I know that many um, supports, cancer support services would have a holistic sort of, you know, um, approach to care. Um, a, I suppose my question is twofold. A, um, does that exist and where can people, how can people go about accessing that? And B, um, you know, should there be more focus on it? Well, I think um, no, no, you can't be treated. It's not your arm that's treated. It, it is your arm maybe that is treated, if you know what I mean, um, or your leg. But if it's only your arm or your leg that's treated, then it's a disservice to the person because you have to treat, treat we're, all, we're whole people. Um, the leg is part of us, but it's only part of us or whatever area we have our cancer in. So it has been obvious over the years that that has been looked at and is being looked at. But I think COVID brings a different extra element onto it again. Um, many of cancer patients were in the shielding list um, and that whole area, especially for people who live on their own, of isolation um, and, and also dealing with the concerns about either treatment or reviews or whatever else is happening. They, it's shown we're not, not any different to the rest of the world that's dealing with COVID, but obviously that extra anxiety that brings in along with the cancer and the treatment anxiety. So yes, I think it is, there, there are many charities out there who offer that, that level of service, um, but some of them have been not able to offer the service because um, of staff having to be furloughed and things, but I know 
um, attached to the, the cancer centre, the, the Macmillan Centre, those services, they're hoping to build those up again. But yes, it has to be made aware. But I would have to say, I have filled in numerous, numerous cancer and COVID or COVID and cancer surveys um, uh, that have come through to, to, and I presume most patients are, are bringing those through. In actual fact, I couldn't even count up the number that I have done over these six months and completed. Um, so people are listening, but it's not enough just to hear the, just the voice and the words of what people are de dealing with. There has to also be action. I mean, we could write all this down. Oh, this is what people are experiencing because of, of COVID and cancer. Um, but then somebody has to lift that and do some action with it, um, whatever that data says. Thank you. Um, this is a, a sort of last reminder to everybody um, in the meeting for any final questions. Um, or else we'll, we'll begin wrapping up. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks to the panel, uh, Mark, Joe, Chris, Margaret, thank you very, very much for giving your time this evening. Um, it's been, been filled with uh, superb content. I'm sure those attending um, will have a lot to take away from this. Thank you to everyone who has attended. Thank you to everyone that submitted questions and added to the content. The session will be available as a recording over the coming days, and that will be promoted um, via social media, the, uh, the Development and Alumni Relations Office social media channels, as well as the main university channels. Um, at the end of the event, there's going to be a final holding slide, which will um, give some direction on how you can support cancer research going forward. So if anyone has a uh, particular interest in finding out more about how you can offer support, then please do stick around for a couple of minutes to take note of that slide. Um, but again, I'd just like to finish up by by thanking everybody, especially the panel. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks. Um, have a good evening, everybody. And uh, Thanks, cheerio. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, everybody.